Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to uh, CXC 2021. Uh, the, we're going to talk with, uh, we're going to witness a conversation between uh, Sherry Flanagan and Rachel Miller, Dr. Rachel Miller. Um, the, we got a little late start because uh, the last panel uh, just got in a little bit, but I think we're going to get going here. Uh, I was 13 or 14 when I first encountered uh, that magazine in the early 70s. I was probably a little younger than their intended audience, but it hit my sweet spot. It had humor, satire, it was edgy and risque, and it had comics. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, it had great comics. It, these comics were, uh, uh, they were edgy, they were uh, everything I wanted. They had like sex and naked people, <laughs> It was amazing, and, and they were hilarious. Um, some of the comics uh, that were showcased in National Lampoon were uh, Cheech Wizard by Von Baudet, Dirty Duck by Bobby London, Ideal by Jeffrey Jones. But my favorite, always, was Trots and Bonnie by tonight's guest, Sherry Flanagan. Shocking and hilarious, but always somehow perfectly true adventures of a young girl on the brink of sexual awakening and her talking dog. Sherry is a, was a child of her era, a true free spirit, artist, and radical thinker. She was a member of the legendary 70s underground comics collective known as the Air Pirates. She was also an early advocate for women in our field. From 1979 to 1981, Flanagan was an editor at National Lampoon and recruited many of the magazine's best known artists. Trots and Bonnie appeared in National Lampoon from 1972 to 1990. Her freelance career has continued with work for Marvel, uh, no, I'm sorry, DC Comics, Mad, Premiere, and recently in a series called Graphic Classics. Rachel Miller, an adjunct faculty member at Columbus College of Art and Design, earned her PhD from The Ohio State University, where she also served as assistant editor of Inks, the journal of, comics, of the Comics Study Society. Dr. Miller writes about comics for American Review, American Book Review, Bitch Planet, Pretty Deadly, and others. She recently co-curated the exhibit Ladies First, a century of women's innovations in comics and cartoon art for the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum just across the way. 
Please welcome Sherry Flanagan and Dr. Rachel Miller. See, I have to find my clicker. <laughs> testing, testing. Yeah. All right. Can you guys hear us all right? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Our slideshow started. Thank you for that introduction, Jeff. That was wonderful. <laughs> You're all right. Hi, Sherry. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> This feels very formal up on stage. Yeah, <laughs> same. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I want to start at the beginning um, with you. And um, I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about how you started, how you got into comics, um, who this is, <laughs> what his comics are about. <laughs> so. Thank you. I haven't seen any of these slides, so I don't know. Everything's a shock. That's my dad. Um, and he really was, he was a rear admiral by the time he retired. He was a submariner who, class of 32 at the Naval Academy. And he was at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed and he cut people out of the Oklahoma that were, that had overturned and stuff. So he, he had a, a really, he was a deep sea diver with a hard hat, a hard hat. So he, uh, he had a real purposeful life. And, and then he, that was his day job. And he was also a cartoonist. And his cartoons are in the Naval Academy yearbook, 1932. And that's one of them. And they're, you know, they're, they're kind of dumb, but uh, cartoons back then were kind of dumb. And <laughs> <laughs> they were a big hit at the Naval Academy and he was always you know, remembered for that. And he uh, basically taught me how to draw. He played with me. And, my sister, uh, I have this one sister, and she became a scuba diver and a boat captain, and so she followed in my father's footsteps, and I followed in my father's other footsteps. Um, so do you remember like seeing him draw from an early age, or was he drawing as you were growing up, or was it? He played yeah. this game with me where you, you, make, you take a number and then you create a character or you keep create a drawing out of the number. Like I liked five because five was, could be the, a guy in, with a cap and then the, the round part of the five was the cheek and you could add a nose and a mouth and the eyes and all of a sudden your number was a character. It's kids like that. I could still do that. Twos are also very good. <laughs> ones are kind of like, okay. <laughs> There's not much to, to ones to, to draw. <laughs> Way too many choices with a one. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but too easy, many options. Easy if you've got, you know, depending on the kid. Mm -hmm. So there, there's probably kids that would prefer a one. Um, was this like a, a, fam a whole family thing or was it just you and your dad drawing together for the most I part? Think my sister was eight years young, older than me, and she was off achieving greatness. At, at eight years old? When I was eight, she was 13. Okay. She was in the NRA, you know, the National Rifle Association, and um, did already becoming a, you know, overachiever. <laughs> um, oh, and this is one of, one of the my paintings. My dad's painting. My dad was like obsessed with the West. <laughs> he loved ghost towns and. And uh, it just, it was a, a big part of his life. And it's probably because of my dad liking the West so much and his influence that Charlie Russell, the Western painter, is, is uh, my really inspiration as an artist. Because Charlie Russell, these, these painters in the West, in, in a lot of the ones that did these magnificent um, scenes of you know Yosemite and waterfalls and, and beautiful places in the West, there, there weren't any photographers at that time. So their paintings, well, some people think it's a bad thing, but their paintings were specifically meant to inspire the westward movement. So, and they did that. They worked on, my father was born in Cleveland and it was all, you know, this New York state and stuff. And, and that's, so his love of the west and the success of that artwork was 
really, it was interesting that it was so purposeful. Um, did he, did you have very many comics around growing up? Like, were you reading comics or were you reading, like? like Read them till my dad burned them. He burned <laughs> and, them? Well, he, he was a conservative. And he, yeah, I had the first Mads, did not like those, but, and, uh, and Superman, um, he didn't burn the Superman, well, later he burned almost everything, because he liked building fires, and so that was, <laughs> it wasn't like he didn't like my comics, it was like he needed fuel for the fire to start, get it started, and uh, uh, so yeah, I, 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 had there, I was a comics fan of some, not all. Until he burned, burned the comics, well, it, for practical purposes. That's why I'm not wealthy today. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it, Dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also, so I was, um, you know, reading your interviews to prepare for this, and I read that you were kind of into publishing from an early age, um, that you published a gossip newspaper <laughs> when you were... She's digging up dirt. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, and I, so I just wanted, like, um, you, you know, want, as a child... Shall I tell them all the details of yes. that, that wonderful publication? <laughs> First of all, yes. What's all the gossip from your fifth grade <laughs> oh, well. elementary school? And then I'm just interested in, you know, why, why was publishing kind of something you were drawn to then? Oh, okay. This is, <laughs> this is when you're in interviews like this, you have to actually look back. It's like therapy. You have to look back into your own life and sort of figure out why you did things you were doing. <laughs> there are a lot of, lot of stuff. Um, so, okay, I, I will just, you know, since I don't know you and I'm never going to see you again, I will just open up here. Um, that uh, in my family, the only place you had any privacy was the bathroom. So I would, I would literally, I would <laughs> like sit there with a TV tray and um, sometimes dinner, but uh, often a book. And then I would, that was my office. And so I did this um, little page, you know, just notebook pages. And I wrote out a little newsletter, handwritten with pencil. And uh, I took it to school and I sold it for a nickel. And they hated that. <laughs> and um, I just, I was into like the little, the, I, don't, I don't really remember what I wrote, but it was probably about the other students. And it probably wasn't that bad. It was probably just little stories, possibly made up completely. <laughs> and, and the thing that they objected to, I think, was that I was selling it. So, um, but that was a, uh, and I didn't. Do, I did not do it to make money. I did. I sold Christmas. My dad used to take me around selling Christmas cards. So, and you know, the, the interesting thing about that is that um, it makes me think that if you involve kids at that level at that age, you know, actually selling fun little things that they created, that you really are creating um, something that can you're planting the seeds that can grow into a career of some kind, you know, some kind. Had you ever seen like um, someone self-publish a newsletter before? Or like, where did you get the idea to kind of do that? Because that's, reader. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was kind of the inspiration. You're like, I'm gonna do this for my, my elementary school. It was great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's sort of in the days when they, they like, they had you open a little savings account and they gave you a little card so you could keep track of the money that you put in it. They did. They they really were into. They were really civics tests yeah. or lessons. Yeah. And were um, so was your dad supportive of the newsletter or was he? <laughs> did he know you were making it? I don't think he did. Okay. I don't think he did. No. They were they were they were at the officers' club drinking. Okay. <laughs> so you can make the clandestine newspaper out of. <laughs> you can do anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I apologize, my slides are a little bit out of order, so I just, <laughs> you were worried about the slides, and I'm like, actually, they're out of order. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, so that's I just flipped. Totally <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, so um, before you, we get to Air Pirates, um, you were in art school. Um, and what was the connection there in art school between being in art school and then your involvement in underground newspapers at the time? Was that, was it before, like, how, how, how did that involvement begin? Well, I, art school, so I had run away from home when I graduated from high school. I went to Canada and I, I was up in New England, which I knew nothing about. At Middlebury College, I crashed at a 
dorm in Harvard and things like that, and uh, came back to Seattle, which was really uh, a very small town at the time, small town mentality. And the art school was a commercial art school that trained you to do commercial art, like um, to, to lay out little ads or, you know, you could be a hit if you, if you work for Hallmark, you had really made it, like Robert Crumb worked for Hallmark when he was first starting out. And uh, so, but I, and the Vietnam War was going on and it had been going on, this was 1970. It had been going on for a long time and here I am doing seven up ads and feeling like a traitor, you know, to my country. So I started uh, going to riots, <laughs> attending them and not starting them. And, uh, and I met these anarchists who were, who were doing this paper. This is Sabat, the one you're looking at. They named it Sabat, that's after, you know, saboteur, it's after the people who threw wooden shoes, the anarchists who threw the wooden shoes into machinery in Holland to um, protest at the military industrial complex or something that was going on there at that time. But anyway, they, I mean, they, they really knew the history and, um, and gave it this kind of dumb name, I gotta say. Um, but it was cool and I, I got to do this, I really was a fan of the Chicago Seed newspaper, which you can kind of Google things like that and see how beautiful some of the papers, the underground newspapers in the Midwest were. And I was really copying what they were doing in this piece of art. When you see, you can see all these parallel lines in it. And the parallel lines are something that I picked up from, from their style. I, 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 I say they, it may have been one person but it was, it was really influential. And, uh, but the, the thing about art school that was so cool was as much as I was really alienated going there from, from the purpose, they taught me all these techniques that I didn't really understand until I was working for a newspaper that was uh, working in the offset four color process, printing process. So that's where I actually got to see the art in motion and got the idea like this is um, a black and white drawing and with a color bleed. And you could do that with offset printing. You could just request that. So it's really, it's a cheaper, it's a, just a step up. It's not all four colors. It's really just two colors. So it's black and white and the bleed. So, um, so that was, it was really experimental. All, all the work I got to do there was really, really fun. And then the weathermen took it over and it was not fun anymore. <laughs> and you were working for these newspapers at the same time as you were going to art school, or was this like sl slightly after art school? I think it mm, it's probably after, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Um, in all that, uh, where did? Oh. Okay. That's all. <laughs> that's all from the Sabat. That's all from the paper. That's an ad. Yeah. <laughs> it's a political cartoon. Where, so where <laughs> did cartooning emerge in this process for you? Um, because I'm assuming they weren't teaching cartooning at art school. Um, no, there was one guy, okay. and one guy who, who, he had a really interesting style too. I, but um, I don't think he got the scholarship. Well, there was one person who, who won a scholarship to the next year of school and, and uh, wasn't the cartoonist. So, you know, that speaks a lot for cartooning. Um, but uh, no, I, I went to a party and there were a bunch of uh, underground comics on the table. And I just sat down and read them all and, and really liked them. And liked the, um, the freedom, liked, liked all the, the, and all the sex, you know. And, because uh, I was 20. And, uh, um, and I thought, well, I could do that. And so, but see, this art style here, this is a comic that they, they let me put in, I think I did this after I met the Air Pirates. So I was learning about doing, um, cartoon balloons and stuff. But um, the style was just more influenced by other people's work. And I, I can't tell you who, you know, it was just that's the underground comic style. You know, big feet and kind of real curvy, the looseness of it. Cause that's the, that's the muscles that you're using to, to draw there, you know, doing curvy stuff. And it sort of, it's the freedom that you have 
lines on paper. It's really fun. It was a fun way to start. Yeah, that kind of like Bigfoot style or yeah. like the 50s Mad Magazine like mm -hmm. style in a kind way. Of, well, that, yeah, yeah, kind of trying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's like yeah. shades of that in here, I think. Yeah. But. Shades. <laughs> shades. Shades, good. <laughs> um, so, okay. Now I have to backtrack all the way. Oh, to that's the us. That's that's oh, okay. me and the anarchists. <laughs> Why is it okay? <laughs> that on the on the left there, that is Maury, who is a dwarf, and he had worked for NASA for years and retired and then became a radical political person. And he was he was wonderful. He really knew the business, and we all just stayed up forever turning out the paper, you know, that's part of it was, the talent was really being able to go without sleep. <laughs> and, and that dog, that's Petra, the, the German Shepherd, who is named after um, Petra, a Russian, uh, uh, Russian Revolution person, I think. I was gonna ask, did the dog stay up as well with you? Or yeah. <laughs> did the dog get to take naps? Yeah, the dog, <laughs> the dog was right there. <laughs> awesome. um, Okay, so now I do want to, I want to talk about the air pirates a little bit, and I have to, I apologize, I have to backtrack. Yeah, like, wee, wee. <laughs> this carousel of images, but, um, so, how did you get involved with this, this, the underground collective air pirates? And Well, I was at a, um, I was at a festival, a, a rock festival that lasted for like 11 days out in the middle of nowhere near the Columbia River. And um, these, the air pirate, the guys who became the air pirates had gathered there. Ted Richards, Bobby London had come from the east. They, I guess they had come basically from New York. They were refugees from another underground paper in, in the east. And uh, Gary Halgren was, had come from Seattle and he was a sign painter. He was like groundbreaking member of the Splendid Sign team, which revolutionized uh, uh, advertising art. In Seattle, they would do beautiful, uh, like Rainier beer ads on the sides of barns, and they brought back all the, the styles of the 20s and things. And it's something that you see all the time now, but it was stuff that was growing in San Francisco and, and also in Seattle. And Doug Fast, the other guy, that partner who didn't become an air pirate, designed the Starbucks logo. So. Um, yeah, it was really, it was really some important creative stuff was happening then. And um, Dan O'Neill uh, had been fired three times from the San Francisco Chronicle. He had a comic strip called Odd Bodkins, and he sent his um, characters to Magic Cookie Land, which meant that they took LSD, and they were never the same. And <laughs> The editors were, everybody, you know, if you had a job then you were conservative and so the editors were really uh, just insulted by what was going on and worried about what was going on and I, it's possible that some papers had dropped him, I don't know, he was still very popular and they fired him and they, people came back and demonstrated and to bring Dan back and um, three times, the ter third time worked and uh, so he, there he was, um, in the river at Sky River Rock Festival, watching people uh, bathe in the river. And that was the first time I saw Dan. Uh, and anyway, with, so we all kind of gelled. We all came together and I, I was, I'd been given a geodesic dome to, <laughs> yeah, but you see, it was the cover, uh, it was a missile silo cover that you could disassemble. Um, it was a Buckminster Fuller design that was used for missile silos. So every, that was the, the early 70s. That was during the Vietnam War. Everything was sort of juxtaposed with like evil and good. Mm -hmm. and, and it was weird. And so anyway, I was, it was a huge thing and we, you could sleep in it. So I invited these guys to come sleep in my dome. And, uh, uh, and, so, and they created a little newsletter. And more, I was there with, representing Sabat, and Maury, the dwarf, could stand up in the back of a pickup, and we, he had a Gestetner machine, this, uh, yeah, it's a mimeograph machine, and he was turning out the, the Sky River newsletter. So everybody congregated there, because we were all into publishing. 
And, uh, and then we published another uh, quarter, quarter pager, like where you fold it in quarters. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if we sold it. I, it's worth some money now. Um, but so, so we all worked together, and then I dragged uh, Bobby and, and Ted eventually up to work on my paper until the weathermen took over, and then they went back down to San Francisco, and I, I followed them. Not a bad place to, to follow someone to, San no, Francisco. Not, yeah, <laughs> no, it was great. Yeah. Um, wh what was like the kind of concept behind the Air Pirates, for, for those who don't know? Um, Yes, I can explain that a little bit because I'm not a fish, I am not the one with the thing for the mouse. Um, <laughs> I can talk to you, I'm going to talk to you about the mouse tomorrow. But um, these guys, okay, I will say this Dan had a thing for the mouse. Dan was attacking the mouse and the other Disney characters before anyone else. And what he did was he, brew, he drew uh, Gary Halgren in to this situation. We were, we were all living together in this uh, warehouse, very small warehouse, living together, sleeping together, one bathroom. It was really very intimate. And, but we were all, it was, it was fantastic because we were all learning how to draw better and write better. And, but, uh, and I think it's Richard Hinkle wrote a book called The Disney Version. You can check me on the name, but it's close to that. Uh, and it was about how Disney was a part of the military industrial complex, which is a term that Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, uh, coined um, to describe the, the evil link between corporate America and the military and how they feed on each other. I mean, you take that for what you want in, politically, but that's what we were involved in, you know, and that's, that's what I believed in. Uh, at the time, Disney, uh, Disney held a patent on the moving sidewalks at uh, Disneyland and had something to do with satellites and also um, just ex like Coca-Cola, you know, was exploiting American uh, products in these countries in South America and think places where things were really hotbeds of, you know, where people were trying to choose how they could live. You know, they, there was a lot of revolution going on in the 60s. And, and so there was again this juxtaposition between the people and democracy, real democracy, and then what we were trying to push on them. You guys know this. You guys know what happened. It's history and it's, really dirty, I think. And, and so I was all for these, what these guys were doing, but they were, they were going after the mouse. And what Dan wanted to do was he, he decided that to distribute these comics, he was gonna hire a bunch of like winos. And we, that's what we called them then, winos and bums, the guys that were laying around in San Francisco. And he was gonna dress them up in like police uniforms and firemen uniforms and official things, and then um, have them like sell comics on the street. <laughs> so, I still think it's a good idea. And then he was gonna have like a blimp, and he was gonna drop the comics out of a blimp. And he was just, he was so inspiring and so fun, and his ideas were so great, and it was so fun to listen to him. He was just, he really was a ringleader, and, and he was just a wonderful thinker. And he just inspired, I went through and I, I was looking at these books, and the art is beautiful in them, and perfect, and, and the, the writing is funny. And it's amazing, it's amazing work. And we did, we did some experimental stuff that, that was just great. And, attracted a lot of good people to around us, publishers. Yeah. What was kind of like the philosophy of cartooning or like the cartooning boot camp that you guys kind of went through that I read about with the Air Pirates? So. Partly, um, well, Dan, Dan had um, been hanging out with this improvisational theater troupe in San Francisco called The Committee. And he picked up on, you know, improv theater, you know, that's where, you know, like you, they, you fall backwards into someone's arms and trust that they're going to be there. And it had a lot of, um, it had a lot of psychology in it. And we played games that had to do with psychology. And what we did was we applied them. Now a comic jam is fairly common. You see people, you know, taking turns drawing things. And we had it 
pretty much gamed out in, a, in these special forms so that it was really challenging. And the thing that I remember is uh, we, we brought some, not everybody could do it. There's, there's, this, there's this game called Who Am I? Where one person leaves the room and the other people decide who you are when you come back into the room, but you don't know. And so you have to guess who you are and ask questions. And it's extremely disorienting and, and not exactly fun, but really challenging to, to not know who you are. You know, you're somebody else. So it was kind of like that, only like when I did a jam with this guy, um, we, I think by the third panel, he was killing my characters and then he just got up and left. <laughs> and so it's like the, the games were very purposeful. Like we weeded out the weak ones by, by uh, playing them. It, it seems like a really like collaborative environment, but also. <laughs> yeah, and also we didn't get along all the time. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, so I read that like, um, you know, you guys all kind of chose cartoonists whose style you, you emulated or learned oh, from. Oh yeah, that was. Could you speak about that a little bit? Of course, it's such a good thing to do. Um, and we specifically were looking at, um, uh, to, so to do these cartoon jams, you had to be drawing a character that you know you could draw and I could draw, and it would look like the same person drew it. That was the object. So we had to pick like we used Felix the cat one time, and we used Popeye, and a whole lot of other things. And we'd take like we'd take a, a nursery rhyme for a while, a, just a simple nursery rhyme. Mary had a little lamb or something or. or whatever, and uh, Little Miss Muffet was one, and, um, and then try to draw that as a comic strip and then mess, mess around with the imagery a little bit so maybe it's not a lamb, you know, that Mary has, and maybe it's not a tuffet, but um, it's, it's very, really fun to do. It's fun. I'm like going like, I want to do this again. It's so much fun. Um, so, uh, so, uh, I think what you're asking me is it's is about you know this this improvisational influence and what influenced the way we worked is that what yeah, you Yeah like what I guess what artists are you, were you guys oh, looking at and like who are you emulating Yeah well yeah and um so the other guys picked their artists I'm not going to go into you know that but I picked um this guy named H.T. Webster. I grew up with uh, collect New Yorker collections and collections of single panel work uh, in my house because my parents had it. My parents, I was 40 when my parents were born, so they had a lot of like really great archival comics in the house. And um, I was particularly attracted to this one guy. I think maybe there's a slide in here of something that he did. Um, H. Harold Tucker Webster. But I knew about Harold Tucker Webster because my, I have a photograph of him dressed as a clown with another cartoonist. And my father said that he used to go to Webster's mother's house and she would feed him lunch. Claire Briggs was the other cartoonist. They both drew in a similar style. And, and the style was, to me, it was so realistic that it looked like it looked like a photograph to me. I, I was recognizing people that I knew in his work, and I didn't think I could draw like him, but I I wanted to. And the other the other influence then at the time was Charles Dana Gibson, who also, you know, had that he had marvelous line quality. Because you remember, like I liked the line quality from the Chicago undergrounds. And I love Charles Dana Gibson's line quality, parallel lines. So just attracted to that. Cross hatching. Um, I do have Charles Dana Gibson images, but they are. <laughs> are they buried? They're buried in, in this. It's okay. <laughs> I have so many images. Um, okay. That was a Dan thing. <laughs> I did want to talk a little bit about um, Trots and Bonnie because um, kind of, um, you know, in contrast to the rest of the underground, who I think were kind of putting their stuff out and, and trying to like build their careers, you really saw like comics, I think, 
in, in terms of Trots and Bonnie, your work there, as like this vehicle for social change, right? That's like something that I kind of like that, see throughout your work, but. That's amazing. <laughs> like you actually just nailed it. Oh, thanks. Totally, that is, that's totally, because what I was thinking about, and I thought about this today, I was thinking like, you know, people ask me a lot, what was it like to be a woman in this atmosphere? And I'm like, uh, I didn't really think of myself as a, you know, a part, a separate from it. And um, because it's the work, it's the work that you think about, you know. But, but I realized that um, even in the Air Pirates where we had this very purposeful sort of mission, um, the guys were really thinking about their careers. They, they were there because Dan was a syndicated cartoonist who was a success and they wanted to be a success too. And, and in fact, Bobby London has really achieved that. He's drawn, he stepped in and drew Popeye until he had olive oil get an abortion. Things were going really great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so they really, and, and they have achieved success. I mean, the, the other guys are actually doing that. So it, it worked for them and it actually it, it worked for me too because I got to do a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. But yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I mean, if anything, I was just always looking for a cool husband. You know, that was, that was like the main thing on my mind, you know, and it's like, well, if I do this, if I hang out long enough, somebody will marry me, you know, and one did, you know. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, yes, it was, it, I just thought everybody had to think like, I, you had, you were either, it's like now, you're either on this side or that side. You know, I, that's the way I feel about these times we're living in now, is you just have to choose, you gotta choose between good and evil. How did you kind of like start to integrate that vision into Trots and Bonnie? Like, how, these, cause you know, the, the setup is kind of like a, almost like a classic newspaper strip with a girl and her dog and her friend. Um, but it, like, as you start reading the comic, it's a little deceptive because it's like, it's got this, um, you know, this kind of like front and then as you dig down into it, there's like this, this underlying message that's very radical. Um, you know, you're talking about what it's like to be a girl, you're talking about sexuality, like all these different things, so. I, I did that, but I, they weren't always about that. Cause yeah. sometimes it was like, especially when I was working for Lampoon, they just, they're, they're orders were draw something that couldn't be in the daily paper, or the Sunday papers. So there, there are strips about dog vomit in there. And that's, of course, that's about advertising. So <laughs> I guess there's always that slant. Um, when you do, when you start out a comic strip that you think is gonna have life, which is what we were doing when we were publishing in undergrounds in San Francisco. We all thought we were gonna do a book and we were gonna to continue to do books. And that was, cause that's, people actually did that then. And they, they did well. Our, the first, we were talking about this, the first print run for an underground comic was 20,000 copies. You had a thousand dollars, they printed 20,000 copies. They sold them in head shops, you know, where they sold marijuana paraphernalia and such. And, um, now I think you're a, at Fanographics. I, this is, and it, inflation may have changed this, but it was like you were a big seller if you sold 2,500 copies. So the economics, you know, it was, it was good economics. It looked good to us. You know, every once in a while, you know, these guys would do a book and they're like, here's a thousand dollars. Let's all go out to dinner. And um, so, when I started this, I thought that there was a possibility of having a future and a, a book and everything. And what I was told was, in your first comic, you introduce your characters. So, th you know, that's what I was trying to do, really. And um, it's really soaked in fe feminism and feminist theory at the time. I really liked it. Why not? Um, power to the women. And, uh, and it worked, you know. We made a lot of changes for women that were, real, I think are good if we can keep them. And uh, so that's, I mean, this is, you're looking at, at the first strip that was in a, the first Trots and Bonnie strip from a comic book. This one wasn't, was this one in National Lampoon or? No, this was, this was in a comic. This okay. is in um, 
Merton of the Movement, I think. Okay. So Merton of the Movement was a pol Bobby London's political comic book, you know, where everybody was doing comics about politics. I really like But they were one. funny politics. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I like in this one how, in that last panel, Bonnie, I don't know if people can see this, but um, she's uh. getting hit in the head with the dialectics of sex and not, uh, you'd expect it to be like a comic book or something, because <laughs> take this smut with you. <laughs> that but, that yeah. was an important, Shulamith Firestone, she was like 23 when she wrote that book and it was a groundbreaking feminist book that was really important. And here it's, um, <laughs> here it's it like is. the lowly comic, the right. smut. <laughs> I memorialized it in yeah. a comic. <laughs> Um, I did want to play, because you sent some really wonderful, oh, some wonderful videos that I hope we can bring up. Oh, yeah, um, that's the beginning of the... <laughs> yeah. that says, it's not it, supposed it to look like a microphone. <laughs> well, I, it's my chance to say that I hope the video works, but I, like, actually created the music. Oh, really? Yeah, that's in awesome. gu guitar, gu what is it, garage band. Garage band? <laughs> garage band. Let's yeah. see if um, they can play it for us in the back. I've been told to say... <laughs> Hi, Wee. please play the comic if you can. <laughs> and for his first act, Trotz will sing a song about the eggplant that ate Chicago. With all the suffering and injustice in the world, you want me to do a meaningless song and dance act? I just want some money for ice cream. Don't you want some ice cream? Well, okay, but if I win an Academy Award, I'm not gonna accept it. So that was, that was the first strip that I did for National Lampoon. I'm introducing the characters, you see, and it's soaked in the, the politics of the time. Marlon Brando sent somebody else to accept his Academy Award because he was protesting against things that were happening to Native Americans. And other people were using the Academy, they're still using the Academy Awards to, to make a political statement. And, um, and it's, this, is about, this is about working for Lampoon. Because in the underground, Robert Crumb, Artie Spiegelman, who went on and really made people's careers, those guys were sitting around going like, you shouldn't sell out. You shouldn't sell out to the big media. You know, whatever. I mean, obviously they did okay, but they apparently didn't want anybody else to. And so, so there was this, uh, there was a real uh, feeling, uh, I guess it was, I, I'm, it wasn't guilt that I felt, but it was sort of this defiance, like, yeah, I'm gonna do this to make some money here. Because when we started out, um, just I'd love to tell you how much money we made. I, I like to tell that to kids, because they're like, they think it's a lot. But we were making, we were making, that was $125, a half page for Lampoon. And then if you did a full page, you got 250. That was enough to live on back then. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, it was big money. It's still big money now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Um, I, so I wanted to include, this is the first uh, Trots and Bonnie strip that I ever saw. Do you remember this one at all? Or? That's not a, that's a, that's not a strip. Yeah, it's just a single panel. That was, we used to go to con comic conventions and, and sell these. And, uh, and now they're being traded on eBay. Yeah. And, this one's over at the Billy Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know it's from there. Yeah, because I know who donated it yeah. and got the tax deduction. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, I have to say, a really good thing for artists that there is someone who's willing to do that to benefit, but also get their artwork into this fabulous museum. That is a very big deal that he can do that. Thank uh, you. Thank you for letting me say that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, something I hear a lot when I, when I talk to people about Trots and Bonnie, they're like, yeah, it was just so much like it's about, you know, sex and periods and 
you know, um, birth control and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it is about that, but it's also about, you know, just being a young person, um, being a girl and having a relationship with your dog and your friends and trying to figure out, find your way in the world, right? There's this like sense of playfulness to these strips. And so I guess I'm just wondering like, you know, how, how did you kind of help these characters navigate this world that you, you know, were documenting? Or? This was shocking when, when I did this. No, this, nobody done this, nobody even, now it's a, if you get your period, you tweet about it. <laughs> so it's true. Yeah, and, and, and it's in the, the Borat movie, there's that scene where she, the woman's doing the dance and, and um, you know, her skirt goes up and you see, you see basically that, you know, and, and it was so shocking and so hilarious in, on film, but you know, it's really a, a kind of acceptable and, um, and it's, I just, you know, I have to say, it could be, I don't know if you guys are like feeling this now or felt it, but there's this incredible isolation that you can feel around, especially around things with your body. And it's like, you're the only one who's going through it. You know, they didn't even have mini pads back then. I mean, they didn't exist. The ones that you could stick to your underwear. And, and now, you know, that's just like everybody's got one, you know? And it's, I love that change. You know, I love that we're moving into this more open future in, in terms of this. And, and really, that's what I wanted to do, was turn over that rock or open that door. And, and cause, having, we had an audience of over, well over half a million people. They were pushing a million. And I remember I was coming from this underground paper that, you know, we were selling it for literally for, you know, 25 cents. And to, ha to be able to reach that many people, I had such a sense of purpose. And, and that, that was part of it, was just like, you're not alone, because I have seen people walking the streets of New York having that this problem but I wasn't inspired it but you know it happens and and uh, I just and to put it out there in front of a magazine whose readership was mostly male that was even better <laughs> what was the like response that you were getting as you published these strips were how are people reacting to it we our deadline was three months in advance I could work from anywhere I could I would sometimes put my artwork, original art had to go in and be photographed. I put my artwork on a Greyhound bus sometimes because that was the fastest way to get it to New York or mail it in or FedEx or whatever. And then it was three months and then it would, it would come out in print three months later. And frankly, I had moved on to the next strip, the next two strips by the time one of these would come out. So, I mean, it was a good thing and it was interesting that it was there, but really, you know, nobody ever really said anything to me about it. I mean, going to comic conventions was the only way that I would be able to connect with people. It's, it's, it's a lonely life. <laughs> I think we have another video that I did want to share with people. So once again, at the back, if you can play that for us. What's the matter, Pepsi? It's almost too horrible for words. My mother found my birth control pills. Oh, no. How did that happen? I was working out at the spa, and she decided to clean up my room. First, she found my diaphragm. That really got her going. Did she find your condom collection? Yeah, and all my rubber items, and my IUD mobile, and my preloaded contraceptive cream inserter, and my vaginal heat gauge. Did she spank you? Worse. Uh-oh. Are you on restriction? No, no. You couldn't even imagine how awful it is. Oh, wow. How awful is it? 
She didn't know what they were. Well, that's not inconceivable. Neither is Pepsi's mother. It's so funny watching that. Like, my face does things, like when I'm drawing. <laughs> I can feel the muscles. Like. Are you trying to revise any panels in your mind? Or? <laughs> it's just, it just automatically does that. Because yeah. because when you draw, you know, I, when I draw, like, I'm, my face is reflecting what I'm drawing. You're kind of acting it as you draw. I guess, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the di doing the dialogue, too, does that. Did you do all the dialogue for these? Or did you have any help? No. Adobe, the <laughs> Adobe Creative Suite. I <laughs> learned how to adjust the the sound so that you can create a male a male voice or That's an older awesome. voice or different. Yeah, it was like <laughs> That's awesome. really fun. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to look at the these strips with uh, where you talk about birth control specifically um, because they're so informational. Like um, you know, you you're really giving medical information in these strips at the same time as, you know, you're, you're, you're the doctor. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not that kind of doctor. But, yeah. If anyone needs medical advice, do not come to me. <laughs> Birth control, anytime. Yeah. We'll talk to you. But yeah, I mean, I'm just interested in that, like, um, was, was that like a conscious thing that you were doing when you were writing this, these strips, or was that just like... This, 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 is a, this was in a comic book that was specifically for women's health. So that was the subject of the comic book, I think, yeah. And so that was like a three or four page strip, I think. And, um, and the question was, oh, why, yeah, I guess, did, why was I talking about birth control all the yeah, time? Yeah, I mean, was that something that you were thinking, that you were like, I need to like include this information in these strips, or was it just something that felt natural to the storytelling of like the, these characters in this world? It's, you know, um, I, I, am, I, I want to help people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, don't, I just, you know, I, I was, as a kid, you know, I was, I was told I was useless more than once. And I think that it is redemption for me personally to feel that my life has some purpose. So, and I really hope I am not alone in that at all. And that's, that's what I, I believe. And so that's in my work and, you know, it's like, don't get me started about talking about birth control. They wanna take your birth control away now. That's what, that's what all these abortion laws are about. That's just, that's the talk about the slippery slope. They don't, they don't want women to be able to control their lives at all. I mean, forgive me if you disagree, but um, I, my, you know, I, was, I lay dormant for a while because things were, were have been pretty good at times. But um, I'm, I'm really, I'm feeling the same stuff now. I mean, it's one reason why it's really nice that this book has come out at this time is because suddenly all this stuff is sadly relevant. Yeah, and that's kind of like um, something that I was thinking as I was reading the new collection that you just came out with is this kind of like immediacy, like these issues are still present, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I guess my last question for you is just like, what was the process of putting that collection together like? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, it was so great. interesting. Because I, I worked with my friend Norman, who's a great designer, who, who Norman worked with Paul McCartney in England for on a lot of projects. So he's, he's a hot designer. And he hooked me up with, um, New York Review of Comics, which is a new comic company associated with the New York Review of Books. So they, they have a lot of publishing know-how. And um, Norman designed the book, but we, we worked on it together. And it was, it was really, I dragged all my original art up out of the basement. And he sent a photographer from New York to Seattle to, we had to find an office where she could set up the lights and, and uh, and take pictures of the artwork. She took pictures of everything, and then I cataloged it. I even cataloged it like in the sizes. I just got everything, you know, like, because the librarians here would know about that. You want to have a lot of detail in your catalog. And I put it into, like, I love technology, if you haven't, like, 
if you couldn't tell from what I've talked about, um, I, put, I put all the list of strips with all the details into an Excel file, and then I gave, uh, I gave the, the, con the strips, a, um, or the pages, a, a code number from one to five, and five had to go in the book one, absolutely don't let anybody see this one. <laughs> and there are some of those. And, um, and, then, and then I sent, I sent my pics to Norman, and he sent his pics. He sent, he sent both of our pics to um, Lucas at, um, at New York Review of Comics. And so between the three of us, actually, Norman said, I even want the twos. So, and I'm like, okay, you know, and then so pretty much everything that got photographed almost went into the book. There are a couple of things in color that were technically too hard to reproduce. So I lost those and may pick them up in another book. But, uh, but it, was, it was so scientific, you know, the way we did it. And then I really wanted to write about these strips because I didn't want to just hang them out there and let you guys guess what was going on. So I said like, yeah, when I drew this, this is what I was thinking, or this is what inspired me on this particular comic. So I really got what I wanted in that. That makes me happy to hear. It's a beautiful book. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you should have heard us arguing about the color on the co the cover. I would love to hear that. <laughs> I, Norman wanted pink. <laughs> and you were like, no. Pink is cool now. <laughs> I, well, I could keep talking to you for hours, Sherry, but I know we're already kind of a little bit over time. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, you're fine. <laughs> it's me. But I. We might have time for audience Q&A, but before that, I know Jeff has something that he wants to share with us. Oh, yeah. So I'll invite Jeff back up here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Did you want the microphone, Jeff, or you? I don't know. Does, does this microphone work over here? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, so well, I didn't introduce myself before. I, I'm Jeff Smith, the, the uh, art director of CXC and the Bone cartoonist. That's not what I came back up here to tell you, though. <laughs> I came up because... Uh, at CXC, uh, this is our seventh year, and since the very first year, we've always uh, designated, you know, we have, some, we have some awards we like to give out. And um, one of the awards is the Master Cartoonist Award, which we want to give to Sherry this year. Uh, and the idea behind the award... I didn't know this was coming. Oh, that's beautiful. It's heavy there. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's so heavy. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it's a, wow. it, we, have a, we have a committee that, uh, you know, we go through a great many uh, artists that are visiting with us. And the idea is, you know, someone who's like has a real commitment to the art form, who's sustained it over a, a long period, and whose work actually makes a big difference to uh to the art form and to the rest of us. So there you go. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Thank you. Master. Who voted on this? The CXC uh, Awards Committee. Oh, thank yeah. you, CXC. <laughs> 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 wow. All right, carry on. <laughs> I knew it about five minutes before we did this, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really excited now. Really <laughs> so, cool. yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome, um, So I don't know, someone's gonna have to tell me, do you have time for audience Q&A, or do we have to wrap things up, or <laughs> someone instruct me about what we should do? Well, let's do a couple of questions. Okay, we could take a couple of questions, I guess. So, yeah, does anyone have questions for Sherry? Yeah, Lauren. Hi. Um, hi, Sherry. Uh, Congratulations, that award is very well deserved. Um, I, would, I want to know uh, about Pepsi, specifically, because uh, Bonnie is so uh, innocent and unworldly and kind of just kind of like really wide-eyed, and Pepsi seems to know everything and do everything. Was Pepsi based on anybody in your life? Was Pepsi like, the girl that you wanted to be, although she's kind of evil, so don't do that. <laughs> she kills people. All the time! <laughs> so, 
person who always has their opinion right there, ready to go. And that is the type of person that she is. That's, I love those people because I am so slow. I have to think about things before I can even figure out what happened. You know, it takes me a while. And, which is good, <laughs> you know, not reacting is good, but uh, you can't, you are who you are. And uh, there was a, a woman named Zach, Jackie Zolshan who used to go to riots with us who literally did carry a gun in her purse and was very, you know, I've learned more about, about human personalities now and, and the oranges, the, the, the risk takers in life, the, the people who get a thrill from, you know, riding a motorcycle or so, things like that, going fast wherever they are. That's, that's the kind of person that she is. So, and I admired that. And, and uh, she just was such a useful character in the strip. And, and it, but it just developed, you know, I didn't plan how the strip progressed. I just started out and let it, let it roll where it rolled. So, thank you. She rolled. <laughs> thank you. Did anyone else have uh, questions for Sherry? Or? I have more questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am super curious. You do amazing cross-hatching work in your in your in your uh, comics. Um, do, what materials do you use? Like, are you a nib person? Are you a micron person? Are you a rotinograph person? I was ready for this question. Oh, I asked you. Yeah. <laughs> are good for lettering and panel borders and stuff. But, you know, I use a blue pencil because it doesn't, it, you, it used to be that it wouldn't reproduce. Or, or a regular pencil, you didn't have to erase it when they photographed the original art. Um, so you can see that on some original art. I'll donate some, you can see it, I don't know. But anyway, um, Hunt's 101 uh, dip pen fleur-de-lis pattern uh, holds more ink. So it's a, it's a dip pen, it's a, it's a nib that you put on a wooden pen, and uh, like a, a very, you find a very black ink that is not going to fade, and then you use a drawing, oh, okay, it's yeah. a picture. You, you did picture. send me a picture of your pen, so oh, <laughs> I knew that this was going to come up, so, so I wanted to include it. <laughs> you, you can see the Hunts 101 point. And um, I also use a, a drawing board, which you can, if you follow me on uh, Instagram, I'm Trots and Bonnie on Instagram, I put, uh, my, I put my art materials up there sometimes. So, uh, and, and if, you, if you point, if you have drawn, if you tape or push pin your, pa your ink, your paper to the, a drawing board, you can lean it up against something and your ink will not blurb out of the end of the, of the pen. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Not a brush, though. <laughs> okay, Caitlin just sent me the signal, so we do have to wrap up now. But Sherry, this has been, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, this has worked out so well. Awesome. Thank you. You yeah. did a great job. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're the doctor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Terry. I think um, you'll be signing books out um, at the, the WEX store, correct? Correct? Is that? If you want to. If you. I was just going to let everyone know. Oh, okay. Did you want to tell us, Dave? Or? That was up to you. Okay. <laughs> who has, who has the, uh, the, the show coming up, though? Right? Oh, there is, so there is the reception yeah, over at the Billy Ireland. The Billy Ireland. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. And, uh, just a little meet and greet. And... Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah.